For the last few months, I've been filming in 360 and trying to get my head around the new techniques and mindset that's needed for a camera that sees everything. And so I've put together this list of 10 tips that serve as an introduction to the world of 360 video. Number 10, the equipment does matter. I'm usually the first to say that it doesn't matter what you shoot with, but when it comes to 360, there are some essentials. For example, this was filmed on a regular tripod and that's quite obvious if you look down. Whereas if we take a hi-hat and attach a monopod, then it looks like this, which is a lot more manageable. We could even put the camera on a cheap light stand to get a similar result. Another essential is a mini ball head, and I'll explain why in a minute. Now, as for the camera, naturally that depends on the budget. You can go for the 40,000 Nokia or the affordable Ricoh Theta, and obviously one of those will be of a higher quality than the other. But I'm using something more mid-range, the GoPro Omni. Now, full disclosure, GoPro did send me this to use for the video as part of the Omni All-Inclusive, which has the Omni rig and all the basic accessories, including software. But they have not told me what to say or had any other involvement in this video. Now, the last thing I want to say is that these tips apply to any 360 camera, not just a GoPro. Okay, tip number nine, the camera is the audience. We have to consider that watching a video in 360 is a completely different experience to regular viewing. Rather than being shown a series of different angles that draw our attention to different things, it's literally as if the viewer is in the room looking around. So most of the time, we'll probably want the camera to be at average human height, which is about five foot seven. But height isn't the only thing to think about. In regular filmmaking, you can cut to a close up of someone and it feels kind of intimate. But in 360, if you get someone really close to the camera, it's, it's like someone's invading your personal space. It's really uncomfortable. And if we want to hold the camera handheld, that can cause two problems. Firstly, it might be shaky, which could feel like an earthquake, not to mention that it's a bit odd to be carried around by one hand. Then there's editing. A lot of people go for long takes in 360, since fast montages are probably even more jarring than in regular videos. Now, of course, we might want that. We might actually choose to break all of these guidelines, but it's certainly worth thinking about the fact that the audience kind of is the camera. The camera is the audience. Tip number eight, be careful with the seam lines. Now, 360 cameras at the moment use anything from two lenses to six in the GoPro or even more in the most expensive ones. And they then take those files and join them into a single video that covers all angles. But whenever you're joining footage, there's a risk of things not lining up. And the best way to demonstrate this is with our own two eyes. If you hold up your hand in front of your face, then you can kind of see through it a bit. And then if you actually focus on your hand, then what's in the background suddenly becomes double vision, your eyes cross. And all of that is because our left eye is spaced apart from our right eye, so it sees a slightly different angle. And so in the same way with 360 cameras, when you get too close to them, there's a risk that either the things in the background won't line up or the foreground won't. So how do we avoid this? Well, firstly, we can just avoid getting too close. The further you are from the camera, the less issues you'll have. And secondly, let's say I was filming myself, I could stand here and I'll have three different lenses filming me at the same time, which is gonna cause some issues when they get combined. So it'd be much better to reposition the camera with the ball head so that I have just one lens on me and now it looks normal. So the short answer is to avoid getting too close and when you do, adjust the ball head so that none of the important things are on the edges. Tip number seven, the camera sees all. Now this one's pretty obvious, but it actually has more implications than you might expect. Firstly is sound. If you have someone standing there with a boom pole recording audio, they'll be very visible. So our options are either to use the built-in mics, which obviously aren't great, or to hide microphones. Most common would be to clip a lavalier under people's clothes to catch the dialogue. And the same goes for lighting. You can't hide big lights behind the camera like normal. So we can either shoot in natural light or carefully hide the lights behind doorways and stuff. Small little LEDs that are battery powered are an obvious choice. And lastly, you might need to hide people or equipment. When I was shooting parkour with my cousin in Texas, I was hiding behind this wall so that I could see what was happening without being in the shop. Yeah. 
Same thing at the ice rink. We were literally sitting there and using the remote to trigger the recording and change all of the settings. Number six, learn to process the footage. Now there are already plenty of great in-depth tutorials about dealing with the footage. So my recommendation is just to watch those to learn how to use the stitching software. With GoPro it's called Autopano Video Pro. And as usual, the post-production is a lot easier when you get things right on set. Tip number five, consider where the audience will look. Unlike regular filmmaking, we can't actually force the audience to look where we want them to look. So how do we avoid the audience just completely missing the important parts? Well, we can actually use some of the same techniques that filmmakers have been using for decades on traditional films, like how our eyes will generally be attracted to movement rather than things that are standing still. Or even more so, audio cues, like if someone is speaking, we'll usually look at them. So it's our responsibility to get the viewer's attention and hold on to it. Because if we have six things happening at the same time, then the audience will just switch between them and definitely miss something. I think the best way to get in the right mindset is to watch other videos in 360, which you can do on a smartphone like this, or for the full experience, you can get a cheap cardboard holder for your phone. The goal is to notice what gets our attention and where we tend to look. Then we can watch our own projects and test them out with other people. Now, GoPro also have some free software for watching VR videos on a computer, so we don't have to use a phone for every single version of the edit. Number four, use your camera as an investment. There's no avoiding that a lot of these 360 cameras are quite expensive, because it's still relatively new technology. But what that does mean is that it's an opportunity for people who do own these cameras and know how to use them, they can actually get a lot of opportunities for freelance work, everything from basic event coverage to some really kind of groundbreaking projects. You could rent it out to other filmmakers. You could even include yourself as the on-set 360 specialist. The way I see it, either rent a 360 camera when you need it or buy one and rent it out to other people. Number three, question the 360. This one's really important. Whenever there's new technology, it's always tempting to use it too much. We've already established that there are a lot of extra things to think about when we're shooting 360. So if I am gonna use it for a project, I wanna make sure it's worth it and it's not just like a gimmick. For me, that means asking the question, does the 360 aspect add anything? If the viewer would be looking straight ahead for most of the video, why not just use a regular camera? And would it be more effective to make use of traditional camera work and editing to show the audience exactly what we want them to see? Sometimes the answer will be yes, and sometimes no, but it's well worth asking the question. Number two, make use of the medium. Right now we're in the stage with 360 where people are still figuring out how to make the most out of this new format, finding the content that best suits it. And so far, I think the main benefit is immersion. Like, you know when you come out of the cinema and it's a bit disorientating, like you're waking up from a dream? Well, that kind of happens every single time you take off those goggles. So with that in mind, it's hardly surprising that these cameras are being used for news and documentaries in war zones to give people understanding of what it's really like to be there. Likewise, travel videos are an obvious choice since they're so visual and focused on location. And then of course, horror. It makes the most of that immersion to make you jump out of your skin. But these are the obvious ones. We're only just getting started. Because tip number one is to tell stories. Now it goes without saying that this medium has huge potential for narrative storytelling. And so I was like, yeah, I'm sure I can come up with a short film idea that incorporates the, the 360 format. But it's actually a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. Like, should the other characters address the camera? And how do you write that so that it's not awkward? Now, is the camera gonna move? And if it is gonna move, then how are you gonna move it without any people being seen in the shot. The point is that anyone can set up a 360 camera and document things, but to actually go further than that and tell a story takes a whole lot more thought. It actually requires us to pretty much forget everything we know about traditional camera work and editing. I know there are people out there right now who are pioneering this new format of storytelling, and while it may not ever replace traditional filmmaking, the potential is huge. My name's Simon Cade, it's been DSLR Guide, and I'll see you next week. By the way, if you'd like to see some of the footage I shot for this episode in true 360 format, just click on the screen now or in the link in the description.